Today, Jeff gets the pleasure of talking with Clive Clark. Clive's played in some pretty cool golf tournaments, one being the 1967 Open at Hoy Lake, where he tied for third behind Jack Nicklaus and one other. Uh, he then went to play the Masters Tournament in 1968. Most importantly, we're going to be talking about Dumbarney Links, which Clive Clark has recently designed. Uh, Dumbarney resides uh, in Scotland, just south of St. Andrews. And uh, it's a mag magnificent course. Jeff's been able to play it, uh, luckily. And I hope you guys enjoy. Uh, Clyde, thank you for joining us today. We're thrilled to have you on the Travel Royally podcast. And for those of you who haven't met Clive or aren't familiar with him, you're about to meet someone who's led a very amazing life. And Clive, I'm about to apologize because I know what I'm about to say is barely going to scratch the surface of what you've done over the last 60 years, but I'm going to play this back. And it's kind of, uh, if you're familiar with the old TV show, this is your life. This is, this is your <laughs> life. So as an amateur Clive right. played in the 1965 Walker cup in Baltimore, uh, for the great Britain and Ireland team, they went, uh, 11 and 11. You had three points of that total. You then spent uh, 11 years playing professional golf, had five professional wins, 21 top three finishes. You played in 10 open championships, recorded three top 20 finishes, including 1967, when you tied for third with Gary Player, behind Nicholas and DiVincenzo at Hoy Lake. You finished 17th at St. Andrews in 1970 when Nicholas beat Doug Sanders when he missed that Famously missed that two-foot putt on 18. You finished 11th in 1972 at Muirfield when Trevino holed out from everywhere to win. You played in the 73 Ryder Cup at Muirfield, and along with Eddie Polland, you played in the Friday Four Balls against Nicholas and Weisskopf, which must have been a thrill. And sadly, the U.S. won that year, 19-13. Um, from there, you went well, on to be... wouldn't have won if they didn't have Palmer, Nicholas, Irwin, uh, Floyd Trevino, and a few others. They, they would not have beaten us. <laughs> <laughs> well, from there, you went to be the... Uh, you went to the venerable club, Sunningdale. You were the pro there for 11 years, but you were associated with the play, the place for 20 years as uh, their playing professional... You were a, uh, on the BBC for 18 years and sat alongside Peter Alice, who's one of my all-time favorites, and the uh, very famous and wonderful writer Henry Longhurst. You then partnered with Peter Alice in a golf design business before moving to the States in the mid-90s to start Clive Owen Design, Clive Owen, Clive Clark Design, I'm sorry, I don't even know Clive Owen, whoever that is. <laughs> So over your career, you've designed more than 35 courses across the U.S. and Europe. And I feel like I'm out of breath just reading through a partial list of your accomplishments. Did I miss anything of note? I think you uh, more than covered it, <laughs> more than I deserved. Well, let's start with um, how I came to know you, which is through Dunbarney. And... Uh, I fell in love with Dunbarney Links the moment I set foot on the property. You've got a wonderful staff there, and the course is magnificent. But you're not only the architect of the course, you were the visionary for the project. You're the founder, and you're the chairman. And Dunbarney has been amazingly successful very quickly, and I know how proud you must be. So tell us all about how that project came about. Well, I suppose, being brutally honest, it's out of necessity. As you remember, in 2008, everything collapsed. I had two very good jobs about to start. And a week later, after the crash, they went starting and life went on. I suppose everybody thought the economy and everything will be good again in the next 18 months or two years. And frankly, it wasn't. Yeah. So I thought we've got to be creative. And I've always had a terrific love of Lynx golf. Uh, growing up in England and playing on the European tour uh, and indeed all the amateur events, quite a lot of them are on Lynx golf courses and it's a different type of game. It's, as you know, uh, it's a running game. The ball pitches and runs and 
that always appeals to me. Uh, I think there's probably more skill in it. Uh, there are more heartbreaks in it. There are more opportunities in it. Um, I love playing in America, but many courses, uh, the greens are very soft. So the ball just goes plop and that's it. Yeah. Um, on a Lynx, you get far more time of the ball actually doing something before it stops. Right. You probably get twice as much time uh, to watch the ball and see what it does. And it rolls here and it rolls. Oh, it's hit a bump there. And oh, crikey, you now it's down in a hollow there. What am I going to do? And you get a variety of shots. You're not playing out of thickish semi rough or semi rough. Very often, uh, particularly at Dumbani, you've got large aprons. And now you can putt it, you could use a six iron, you could use a utility club, you could use a sand iron. You get a lot of variety in terms of choice of what you might do. And I think that's what makes uh, a Lynx course particularly interesting. And at Dumbani, uh, I designed it really to be uh, a course where people have to think and also think it's a very because of that it and the risk and reward there's a lot of risk and reward out there so you can play a hole in a very safe or conservative way and many of the holes if you want to take on something which is a challenge but if you get it right you're probably going to make a birdie or you know a high handicap golfer make make a power or whatever but I always say that opportunity to make a birdie or maybe an eagle even for the very good players it's rather like shopping at Harrods when there's a 60% discount. You feel you're kind of getting something for nothing out of it. So right. um, that was the basis. And uh, unusually, you see, I love, if I can, and it gets more difficult with time because the courses get longer and longer. And now you're having to have a golf course if you think you're going to have a tournament, even an amateur tournament it's going to be fairly well over seven thousand yards right and getting short par fours into that format can be challenging for a designer uh, now we had a lot of space here we had 345 acres that's a huge site i mean you can comfortably get a golf course in, in about 160 so i was fortunate that i could go in all sorts of directions so that's exactly what I did. And I took advantage of the views uh, of the Firth of Forth. And in fact, it, it's a big panoramic view of water. There's at least 200 square miles of water that you look at and you look across to Edinburgh and Muirfield and uh, that whole uh, coastline, which is about 10 miles away. So on, on a reasonably clear day, you've also got something to look at on the right. other side, which is an advantage. But to get three short par fours in, I, th I thought would be a lot of fun for the golfer. But none of them do you just tee off, here's the tee, here's the fairway, and there's the green. They're dog legs. So if you play it very safely onto the safe fairway, you then turn left or you turn right, and you have maybe a wedge or eight hand to the green. But equally, if you go on the dangerous line, you have to carry all the rough and, and some fairly gnarly looking pot bunkers. <laughs> and, and or a you, fence, a stone fence. Yes, we have a stone wall there on yeah. 17, which is over 300 years old. And if you carry over there and go for the green, you've got to make the carry over the wall. And there's about uh, eight or so really gnarly pot bunkers. So it's not a wide gap. But, you know, you pay your money, you take your truck, but it makes you think. And you stand on the tee as you would on number five, which is a par four. And there's two ways of playing it. You can go straight for the green to a 25-yard fairway, which is protected by bunkers on either side. Or you can go out to the right of this huge cluster of bunkers and you've got half of a fife to play into, but it makes the hole much longer. And the first time I played the hole, uh, I hit two balls and I hit two good drives, one down the short line, drive and nine iron, a very good drive down the wide but longer way of going, drive and four iron. So nine iron versus four iron. And it makes you think, do I want to take the risk of the bunkers and the 
fairly narrow fairway, or do I want to play it safe? I took uh, the long way home there, just so you know. A lot of holes. Sorry? I said I took the long way home there, just, just so you know. I went off to the right and uh, took the long way home. Well, I, I bet next time you try the other way as well. well. But that's now that the you thing. say that, I, yeah. I, I, I really want to come back because I might have done things differently next time. I might have tried this line or that line. And that's the part, the element of making you think when you play the golf course, which personally, um, I, I design golf courses for golfers who are going to play it. So you've got a vast array of handicaps and they've all got to have a way of playing that golf course. But I think to designers, they like to design a course that also they enjoy playing themselves. But, you know, if, if you're a pro level, you, you, you can't make the tees and the greens and everything to you know something that only the best players in the world can play because they're not your customers right right i think uh it was fun to watch the women's scottish open there ryan o'toole played a, a, a absolutely magical round it seemed as though she didn't miss a shot um uh at any point but um Going back to, to the development of the course, when you when you found the property, uh, it had been a farm for uh, cattle were grazing there before you bought it, and I, you had to move a lot of earth. It seems like a Herculean task to move that much earth, but tell us about that because I, I forget how many a hundred hundred tons of dirt you had to move. Um, it was about in cubic yards it was about uh, 700 wow uh, thousands isn't it yeah 700,000 cubic yards wow yeah yeah which is quite a lot I, I have moved more in the desert than <laughs> that um, but that that was about for me anyway the right balance because it wasn't an it was uh, genuine lynx land but it was relatively flat. It was two levels. There was a big coastal level, then a gentle escarpment, and there were, I'm going to guess, about 100, uh, maybe 100 acres on the top, which gives you beautiful views. You're elevated, and it allowed me to design right. holes with tees on the top and greens down on the coastal level, so you've got the whole background of the Firth of Forth, where you actually look right across the water to Muirfield. If you had a rowing boat and you kept going, you would hit Muirfield if you right. set off in a straight line from the beach. Well, I, I think the, those 100 acres up top also gave you the ability to put in um, a nice practice area, which um, American golfers prefer. There, you know, a lot of Lynx courses you go over, they have no warm-up area. Occasionally they might have a... Uh, chain league fence cage with a astroturf mat for you to hit balls into the net, so to speak. But mm -hmm. it's nice to have a, um, a facility like yours. That's so well thought out and uh, it's got a, it's got a wonderful clubhouse as well. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. Just coming back to the course, I had all these acres, 340 uh, acres, which uh, was a terrific bonus. And as you rightly say, there are actually only two sand dunes on the whole of the golf course area. There were coastal sand dunes, which fortunately were not that high. So it, it gave us the opportunity to look over them and look into the Firth of Forth. And we, many of the sort of good wide panoramic views are from the part furthest away because you're high and, and you can see everything. When you go down to the coastal area there are holes that are right along the coast and so you can get on some of the greens and tees very close to the water which right. uh, is nice so you get a great contrast there and in fact on the golf course because of the dunes and the way they're laid out you don't see a lot of other golfers on the golf course it's more or less you feel to some degree you're playing your own four ball and there's nobody else out there which I always think is an advantage because it enjoys allows you to join, enjoy the site, uh, the water, the coast, the other side, and there are no houses on the golf course, so it's pure golf. Yeah, I, 
you know, the thing that I mentioned to you in, uh, before we turned the uh, recording on was every time you turn the corner away from a green complex to the next T, I said, wow, all 18 times. And I agree with you. You can't see many other holes um, once you're in, in between those dunes. On, it seems like every hole, you couldn't see other players. You, you couldn't see other holes. It was a very secluded, it felt very secluded um, to play there. It was, and as I mentioned, we're every, literally every client that we have that's going to Scotland, we're, we're, it's a must play for them. Absolutely. Well, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so let me ask this, when you were, you said that the design or it came out of necessity based on what happened in 2008 through 2010, did you look at any other properties or did this one rise to the top very quickly or how did you find it? Well, I found it a great friend of mine, Malcolm Campbell lives, who is a, a golf journalist, um, lives about three miles down the road and he'd been looking at this site and walking down the coast, he likes walking and uh, he loves playing golf, he's a single figure golfer but he just kept looking at the site and imagine what could be, because in, if you just looked at it before there was a golf course and before we moved the dirt, it was pretty much flat, but it is a genuine Lynx site with sand and fescue growing. Um, and the views you get of, of the first of fourth. And Malcolm actually told me about it and I was going over to Britain. So I said, well, I'll fly up and take a look. And, Immediately, I saw the potential of this site uh, to produce the lynx because lynx are very, very rare uh, throughout the world. Uh, uh, Malcolm was involved in a book a few years ago called True Lynx, and they identified about 240 lynx only in the entire world. Now, when you go through the list, probably there's about 40 or just over of what I would call five star lynx. And some of the links in the world are, yeah, they're links, but you know, they're, they're not special links. Right. Um, this site had the opportunity to make something special, not because it was necessarily naturally there in the first place, but it had the bones and the ingredients and with moving the dirt. And I don't think many people would play golf there and say, wow, you know, it was a flat area. Mm -hmm. I don't think they would. It, it, it looks like it's been <coughs> there a long time. And of course, that's exactly what, uh, what you would like. Exactly. It does feel like a, it's been there a long time and, and it feels like it's fully grown in. It, 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 it looks like it's been there a hundred years. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, let's let's go on to some other topics. The <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the next topic I had was uh, you. Uh, how did you get into golf to begin with? Uh, I started playing when I was twelve, and the reason I started, I loved sport. So I was captain of the school soccer team, captain of the cricket team. I like roller skating, I like snooker, billiards, table tennis, uh, fishing, either be it off the pier at Scarborough or going out in a, a boat. I had a friend who had a boat, so, uh, and I, I, I didn't, I, I came from parents who worked very, very hard um, and they encouraged me to, to do sport as, as well as school. So I had enough qualifications at school to get to university, which, which was good. Uh, but in the summer holidays, which in Britain were about um, six, seven weeks long, you can't play soccer and you can't play cricket because you can't find 21 other people to play with. Right, <laughs> right. Sort of so I thought I'll take up golf or tennis. And golf came first and I just loved it. I mean, I was passionate about it. And in the Easter holidays and six weeks of summer holiday, I would play three rounds of golf, and I mean every day. And yeah. I would practice in between, and then I'd take my putter home at night and spend an hour on the carpet at home practicing my putter. Right. So I, I, 
improved fairly rapidly because I had that facility and you know, I couldn't wait to wake up in the morning back to the golf course and off we go again. Well, I would, I, I would say you became very good very quickly, yes, because uh, I think you were only 20 when you played for the on the Walker Cup team. Yes, yes, that was, um, yes, started the season at 19 and I just turned 20 and I played in the Walker Cup. I played uh, both foursomes with uh, Michael Manalek, who uh, he, he actually won the amateur, he, he stayed amateur all his life. He won the British Amateur Championship five times. He then became uh, what they used to call secretary, now chief executive officer of the Royal and Ancient for 16 years. Uh, he was knighted by the Queen in 2000. Wonderful, wonderful man. and. Uh, I always look forward to seeing him. He still lives in the St. Andrews area. Yeah. Uh, when we uh, go over to Scotland, which we did for quite a period last summer. Um, and I was undefeated in the four matches of the Walker Cup, which uh, was good because that was in Baltimore. And we, um, we halved that year, which I think was the first time since the 20s when the Walker Cup started that we hadn't lost in America. Oh, in America. It's not very big in England when you think about it. I mean, I mean England or, or Britain probably drops twice into California. So, right. um, you know, it's, it was slightly David and Goliath, but uh, nevertheless, we got, um, we got a half on American soil. Was that your first trip to the States? Oh, yes. I think it was nearly my first trip out of Great Britain, to be honest. Yeah. I've been to Southern Ireland, um, which... Um, I remember we arrived at a large old hotel in Baltimore and our, um, the, the then secretary, the Royal and Ancient, Brigadier Brickman, who was a good man and we all, you know, I was very young and I'd get great respect <laughs> for Brigadier Brickman. You know, it's a long flight when you've never been on an international flight of that right. sort of length. And we got to this hotel and across to the time change we're having dinner at about midnight or o'clock in the morning and the staff were on a go slow so the menus took forever when we got an order in it took forever and um, brigadier brickman was signing on behalf of the team so he signed he signed the bill and the maitre d came rushing back and said excuse me sir but i think you missed something and said, what would that be, my man? And he said, well, you haven't put a service charge on there. So the Brigadier Brickman said, my dear man, give me the check back. Scribbled away, gave it back. For the service tonight, I have deducted 15%. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's hilarious. Uh, so what were your impressions of the, of the States? Because it's uh, quite different from back then, from, from Great Britain. Well, I loved it. And uh, Joe Carr was our captain, who was a three-time amateur champion, then sort of retired from professional golf, but um, wonderful character, Joe, Irish. He lived on a golf course called Sutton which is just outside of Dublin and it's nine holes. And it looks to me as if it was uh, prepared on about uh, 30 acres, you know, everything yeah. fresh and short little par fours. And they used to say when Joe shouted for the whole course ducked. <laughs> but he, he was used to it. And so he led his team into the lock and I had never seen a clubhouse like it. Uh, this was Five Farms, Baltimore. You know, yeah. big, expensive American private country club. Uh, not what we were used to in England, I have to say. Uh, and we go in there and everybody's got a locker and their name's on it. And Joe opens the team locker and an avalanche, boxes of golf balls fell out, which in those days, of course, you weren't allowed to accept uh, golf balls as an amateur, but for a walk cup. And Joe looked and we're smothered in boxes of golf balls as the locker opened. And Joe said, geez, another miracle. Um, <laughs> but lovely guy, Joe. And he captained a, 
very good team. Uh, that, that, that was great fun, I must say. Um, and playing in America, you know, different type of game. It was quite hot, close to 90 degrees. Now, where I came from in the northeast of England, a hot day was 70 degrees. So you didn't see 90s. But yeah, yeah. The first, the first week or two before, we put on cashmere sweaters on a warm day just to kind of get used to it. <laughs> That's funny. Well, I know... Um... I guess right before that, you had studied architecture, building architecture, not golf mm. architecture in London. Um, so obviously you were smart enough to go to university, but what led you to professional golf? What led you to say, architecture is not for me, I'd rather be a, a professional golfer? Well, when you've played a lot of golf as a teenager, an amateur, uh, it's a seven year course to become an architect. And I looked at that and I thought after six months, I really like playing golf. And my parents said, well, well, fund you to go and play in amateur tournaments. And I had a very good year. I finished first and second in each of the seven national events. Um, and it was time to turn pro. Yeah. Well, you were on tour in the uh, late 60s through the mid 70s. What was the European tour like? back then? Well, not quite like today. It was, uh, I enjoyed being in Britain and parts of Europe, but there was a, an early start, which you had a month in Spain and Portugal, Italy, which, which sounds great, but if you don't speak the languages, it's fairly difficult because you can't read the newspapers, you can't go to the cinema, you can't watch TV, and you can go out to dinner with your mates who are also professional golfers, and probably you don't want to speak golf every single evening having right. played all day long. So right. It, today it's much more luxurious, the money is way, way higher. But having said that, they were great times. Um, I was used to attend to in, play in Britain, stay with friends which was always very nice because you get away from what you did all day and have different conversations. Um, I think it's very different today. Very different. Yeah. Um, uh, it seems like back then, at least it seems that way. It seems today that people, the way that people travel, they have private jets and, and so forth. But when you were playing back then, I know a lot of people used to travel together. They stay together was there someone you were particularly close with that you traveled with or found to be a particularly good travel companion yes um uh, several different ones over a period of time but uh, peter Eustace and i traveled quite a lot together uh, malcolm gregson john cook not the american john cook we had a john cook of our own in yeah. britain um which is always good you know you've got someone to chat to um uh, some companionship, particularly when you're traveling abroad around Europe. Uh, right. Less so back uh, in Britain. Now, your first win, you won the Danish Open, which must have been a thrill. But I think you almost won the Spanish Open. Was that a playoff? Uh, yeah, or the Spanish Classic uh, had a playoff with Gary Player. I don't seem to pick the easy ones to play against. <laughs> <laughs> I was in four playoffs. I won two and lost two. Ah, okay. Okay. Exciting stuff. Actually, the Danish Open, I finished birdie birdie to tie two of the players and made a three on the first hole. Wow. To win. You know, sometimes you get lucky. What can I say? Sometimes <laughs> you three put the last to lose or something ridiculous. But I uh, played with, um, the, the last round of the Open in 67, I played with Jack Nicholas in the last round. We were lying third, he was third, I was fourth. And we ended up going up a place. So I finished tie for third with Gary Player and he moved up to second. Uh, I shot a 72 that day in a fairly breezy day, which is uh, you know, quite good, particularly considering, you know, Nicholas was the number one player in the world and was quite, he, he was a very nice guy to play with, but it is somewhat intimidating if you're not used to playing with the number one player in the world. 
and he hit it a very long way, which is also, it, it actually took me out of my rhythm to start with, because I played very well, even in the practice rounds, but uh, I, the 72 was a very round because I started six, five, five, so pretty much lost four shots straight off the bat. Wow. And I learned somewhere in the back nine, five to play, I've just got to stop watching him. So every time he hit a shot, not out of disrespect, just my own survival, I turned my back, slowed my swing down, and I finished three under for the last five holes. Wow. That's fantastic. Don't get what did... taken out of your natural rhythm by somebody else and watching them, you see. You never learn. So what did Nicholas shoot that day? Uh, 70. Wow. So not... Had you not got, gotten off that difficult start, you could have been a different outcome. Well, not yes. that, it, not that a T3 that, is bad in the open. I mean, that's... Golf is all ifs and buts, isn't it? <laughs> right. It's the fascination of the game, and you just don't know which player. You know, even with Tiger, you, you, you know, he, he had a difficult time. Great as he was. I mean, probably nobody has played greater golf than Tiger. Right. You could put Nicholas's uh, 18 majors together. I think Jack also was runner up in 19 of them. I mean, he was there all the time. Right. Amazing player. Uh, as Tiger, but it's a kind of, you could argue either case who was the greatest player who ever walked the planet. Um, yeah. And it'll probably never be solved. Right. Right. I, I, but Tiger had a similar. Uh, I've heard from other pros that they felt the same way that you did when they played against Tiger that you had with Jack that, you know, hit the ball so far, he was intimidating. The crowds that were around him uh, was off-putting to a lot of players. And, you know, you felt like you'd lost a couple of strokes to that, to that player just based on whether it was intimidation or awe or the crowds, the, uh, Yeah. And the, you see, Jack was a great gentleman. I remember that particular round I was referencing. I'd hit my second shot, um, it was at Hoy Lake, or Liverpool, as it's otherwise known. And I had a two iron, and there's, there's an out of bounds right along the right edge of the hole, right up to the green where the practice ground lies. So, literally, if you just miss the green a fraction right, you're out of bounds, which happened to me. So I'm left with a five footer for a six on the first and all the galleries start moving towards the next tee because they want to see Jack Boomer and off the second tee. And Jack held his hands up in a very loud voice, said, ladies and gentlemen, please stand still. My partner still has to putt. Now, that shows great, great, great sportsmanship. Yeah. Well, now, I think that's one of the things that's unique about golf. We, we call penalties on ourselves, right? We... Hmm. Um, I, I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to uh, win a match because someone played poorly. I want to win a match because I played well. Exactly. You know? exactly. So after playing, I, I went to the safer seat of being in the commentary box uh, for BBC. And I also in the early 80s did uh, several masters for CBS, uh, which uh, strangely I was put on the 16th hole where when I played in the Masters, I'd hold in one. Um, but um, it, it was great back in, back in England, working with BBC, I was working alongside Peter Alice, who I think is likely the greatest golf commentator that has ever been. A uh, right. wonderful voice, but great sense of humor. He added a lot of light to the yeah. uh, shows. And we went out to Australia together uh, one year to commentate for Australian ABC on the Australian Open. And when we arrived, uh, the producer said to Peter, myself, look, we're now metric. So you can't say it's a 10 yard putt, it's a nine meter putt. Now that didn't suit Peter. Uh, he, He's a traditionalist and golf was always yards. So we go on the air the first morning and Peter says, well, here he is, Peter Thompson, and he's got nine paces to the hole. <laughs> he's not going to bow to metric. 
Where did you happen to see, or were you, maybe you were there at his induction into the World Golf Hall of Fame? Yes, he invited me to go over, and fortunately, we um, had a client coming into town that week, and we couldn't go. And I watched the tape many times because I did many corporate days with Peter back in Britain, and he's a wonderful after dinner speaker too. As he referenced that particular speech, no notes, you know, it's no notes, right? Yeah. He could stand up and speak and be humorous and tell all sorts of uh, tales. And, you know, his commentary, when, when I say he added much light, I remember once we were at uh, Sunningdale uh, doing the uh, European Open and we're on the air in the afternoon about three o'clock on the camera. But Sunningdale is a magnificent oak tree, huge symmetrical oak tree behind the 18th green. And the camera started on there and it panned across to the clubhouse, which is adjacent. And there's a clock tower and it's now three o'clock in the afternoon. And the clock says 10 past 10 in the morning. So the camera goes across, pans on the clock. And Peter says, well, he said, the clock doesn't work. Just like most of the members at Sunningdale. <laughs> And then it was Longhurst. I, I was very fortunate. Um, my first two years of commentating for BBC overlapped with Longhurst's first two years. And, uh, you know, he was a wonderful uh, writer, great commentator. But he, you know, he, he, everybody wanted to listen to him, but it would be very crisp and to the point. So he never wasted, he never wasted words. And he was commentating when I hold in one on the 16th hole in the Masters. And so the, it cuts to me about to play my tee shot, which was right into quite a strong wind. And the pin was back right and I'm hitting a two iron. But all Henry said is, well, here's young Clive Clark from England, and I dare say he's got a long iron in his hand. And then there's a long pause when I have a practice swing and hit the shot. It rolls across up the green, up the bank, into the hole. Well, the people on the left, there's a huge grandstand by the lake there. Yeah. And they were doing everything but jump in the lake. I mean, the hoops and hollers, and there was a lot of noise. And eventually it died to a silence. And all Longhurst said was, hmm, and there you have it. That was it. So as somebody once wrote, they said, uh, Henry was capable of having brilliant flashes of silence. And That's brilliant. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, that, that was uh, Henry. Uh, and he had a sense of humor as well. I remember once we went to a cocktail party and I just come back to America. And I had a beautiful silk tuck, a splendid jacket, you know, it was, it was just very neat. We've been shopping, a friend of mine, Peter Townsend, now, lots of nice gear and dressed up for the cocktail party. And I say, Longhurst had a sense of humour. He came up to me and he said, my dear boy, is that your old school tie or just your own unfortunate choice? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and he didn't mean it unkindly. But a great man. He could talk about a brick for 20 minutes and you would think it was the best object you'd ever come across. And that, wow. that was his, that was his uh, talent. Well, I'll tell you, for, um, you know, um, you mentioned uh, Peter Alice being a great commentator. He worked here in the States for, for many years. He was a mm -hmm. favorite of mine. Henry Longhurst was... Amazing. Did you know Ben Wright at all? Because he was another popular broadcaster here for probably 20 years or so. Mm. Yeah, indeed. I knew him very well. He, he used to write for the um, uh, Golf World and the Manchester Guardian. And I remember when I was about 18, he did a, when we come, I was playing somewhere near Manchester, and he did a feature article on me at 18. So I know Ben for very long time. In fact, Ben was uh, responsible for the work I did several years in a row on the Masters. 
um, oh. who were short of a commentator. Somebody had resigned or they hadn't gone forward with somebody. And Ben said, uh, I know Clive, you know, he works on the BBC. And Ben in those days, early days, was ITV before he came to CBS over here. So it was uh, very kind of him to put my name forward. And the producer, Frank Chikinian, took him up on it and uh, was great. Love, love coming over to the Masters and a couple of other yeah. tournaments and sitting up there in the tower. and. Um, it was great. Did you have you heard the story about how Ben met the Beatles and his influence over them? The Beatles. The Beatles. Did you say? Yeah, the Beatles. No, tell me. He, uh, for a while, when he was in Manchester or excuse me, Liverpool, he had a he was hosting a television show, a variety show, and he was supposed to have an Irish tenor on, and the Irish tenor couldn't come on. So a talent scout found these four lads from Liverpool and invited them on. And so they come in for the sound check and they've got long hair and they're scruffily dressed. And um, he told them, you, you can't go on the air like that. So he gave a runner for the show a couple hundred dollars. He said, take them to a department store and get them dressed properly. They came back in black suits, white shirts with a black tie which obviously became their signature at the beginning, their signature outfit. And, uh, and they got paid 500 pounds. And uh, when, the sh when they got the check, John Lennon goes back into the office and says, can we be on next week? Because 500, it was a weekly show and 500 pounds to them was all the money in the world. Yeah. And he said, no, but you can come on next month. So next month they come back. This time, there's a couple hundred people around the studio kind of blocking the doors for them to get in. 500 pounds again. He brings them back the next month. The next month, there are 10,000 people there and policemen having wow. to. And then after that one, um, Brian Epstein, who has become their manager, mm -hmm comes and says we'd love to have them back on the show and he goes well they take 500 and he goes no but they'll take 5,000 <laughs> and that was the last time he saw the Beatles well that was the last time that but he take, he took great pride in the fact that he helped introduce um, the Beatles uh, to Great Britain through television so a very funny story uh, yeah, but he was, was he was one of those he was one of those announcers that we loved over here I think we love people whether it was uh, you or Peter Alice or or um, Ben Wright, the, the accent, your knowledge of the game. Um, you mentioned uh, Peter Ustays, and I know he's South African, but or Australian. Yeah, uh, Peter Oosterhuis, not Oosterhuis. Oosterhuis, yeah. Yeah, he, he's English. Yeah. Oh, he is English. He My, bad. English. My bad. No, I just like I just like to have Oosterhuis and swing. That's yeah. What a yeah. swing! Oh, what a yeah. bat! What a swing! Yeah, Peter Oosterhaus. I'm. It's. I'm very sorry to hear what's happened to him, but yeah, he, sure. he was a wonderful broadcaster. But he was a wonderful golfer. I. I. I don't think many people realize how good of a golfer he was. Yeah, he. Um, he had a spell in. I think he led the money list three years in a row in the European Tour. Yeah. And he came fairly close one year in the Masters. He was actually leading, I think, by three shots after three rounds, but he didn't play so well the last round and got overtaken. But uh, no, very, very good uh, golfer, particularly good short game. Yeah. So uh, through the BBC, you got to know uh, Peter Alice, and then you, the two of you partnered in a golf design business. How did that come about? Um, we were just talking in the commentary box one day and I thought he was still going with his previous partner and he said, no, we haven't been doing stuff for two or three years. So I said, well, you know, I can draw. I've been to uh, art school and architectural college, so I can draw plans and I, I can freehand sketch and do stuff. So I said, would you be interested in us getting together, forming a company and 
doing some design. And he said, um, I'd love to. That's a great idea. So we, we did. And it was just the time when uh, the RNA had put out a report, we need 600 more golf courses or whatever the report was. And golf was just popular. And the phone was ringing off the hook, I yeah. mean, quite literally. Um, so we, we got a lot of jobs, which was great. And, um, you know, having, because in Britain, I mean, Peter was very, very po popular in America, but in Britain, he, he was pretty much the man. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a good combination. I could draw. He could certainly talk. He was great in meetings and uh, it, it worked very well. Well, then in the mid 90s, you leave him and you come to the US and start Clive Clark Design. And for you, I know based on that background of art and architecture school, that you see things very differently than a lot of architects. You're a very visual person. Yeah. And that's very different from how a lot of other architects um, design golf courses. Talk to us about, about that process from your perspective. Well, I would describe myself more as an artistic type of designer. Um, many, many of the architects come from a landscape background. They've studied landscape at university. That's, that's one way of having a knowledge of how to draw contour plans, grading plans, etc. cetera, um, which is probably the most time consuming element of designing a course, the layout you can do fairly quickly, master plan you develop, uh, and I, I do my own grading plans. So you're, you're taking all the existing contours and you're putting in your new contours, which it's after you've been going for an hour or two, it's like looking at a bowl of spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> I actually color each each contour, I give a different color too. If you just go in one color, it can get, you know, quite uh, quite confusing. Yeah. <laughs> so I think of the club golfer or the member. And so when I do the various layouts for tees, it, you know, as a former competitive pro, I, I know how far a scratch player or a good pro hits the ball and then I figure out the sort of you know, 12 handicap guy, nine handicap guy, what's he going to do and I, I kind of plot it out. He hits the ball so far so let's put a dot there and see what sort of shot he's got left. Um, and then usually with the ladies I get a little consortium of lady members together so I've laid out, I've laid out the master plan and I take them out to lunch and then we look at the plans and say, well, how far do you hit it? How far do you hit it? Okay, let's put an X here and an X there. Now, how do you feel about the next shot? Oh, it's a bit narrow for me because, you know, you've got a lake coming just in there where I'll hit my second shot. So, okay. So, you know, generally I'm sort of 95% down the line, but it's just nice to check. And uh, if it goes wrong, of course, you can always blame someone else. Yeah. Well, when you designed Dumbarney, did you, um, it's different because they've already had a professional tournament there, but did you design it with that in mind that this could hold professional tournaments? Yeah, very much so. I, yeah. I got a very good vibe about how it was going to turn out, particularly as it was a pure, genuine Lynx golf course. Um, and having a tournament is or a championship is wonderful publicity for the club. Yeah. Um, so in fact, although on the card, the black tees, the back tees are just over 6,900 yards, which is enough golf for most people with a stiff breeze blowing on. Right. Uh, I have uh, what I call 13 professional tees which stretches it out to 7,000, an enormous 7,600 yards. And if we had a male tournament, 
we would obviously use some of some of those teas. The girls played it at about six six, which was a good length. I mean, they did very well. I mean, um, Lydia Ko shot sixty three in the last round. Yeah, I mean, that's quite a quite a remarkable round. But you know, it, when when the breeze wasn't stiff, so to speak, the, the girls could. Uh, you, you know, they're so straight. I. Um, I like in Rancho Mirage, they have the big major ladies uh, LPG event, and I always go along to that. Not, not so much to walk around, but I love watching them on the practice ground. They, they are excellent players. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've, um, I took lessons from a woman that was a, an LPGA player, and I played in two LPGA pro-ams, and I mean... <laughs> My good, they hit the ball straight. They hit it far. They have wonderful short games. They putt well. And I'll tell you the other thing, with all due respect, they're much friendlier than the male players because I played in a men's, a PGA pro am, and they want nothing to do with you. the The women are were very welcoming. It was it was amazing. But um, good. yeah, I had um, this young lady who. Uh, plays on the LPGA called Kelly Tan and she comes to stay with us. Uh, and I have a, a friend I was playing with off one handicap and he goes to the gym every day and pumps hands, and, you know, a guy about 40. And, uh, Kelly had to go off to a meeting. She joined us on the 11th hole. So as we're going to the 11th hole, my buddy says, um, is uh, she going to be long enough to play off our tees? So I said, oh, I think she can handle it. And she's about five foot five. So he rips one off the 11th tee and she knocked it 20 yards straight past him. I said, yeah, I think she's long enough. <laughs> uh, that's great. I played with, uh, I'm trying to think. I played with a woman, her name was Jenny Lidback. She had won a major. She's probably in her mid fifties now. Well, yeah, she's probably in her mid fifties. Most delightful person. Um, I drove it about as far as she did, but she was she was older at the time, meaning she was probably 40, which for an LPGA player mm. is old. She wasn't a gym rat, so she was hitting it probably 250 off the tee. Um, and um, but just a remarkable short game and and then I played with a younger girl the next year who was um, an All-American at the University of Oklahoma, and she bombed the daylights out of it. Um, but anyway, hey, so you've, you've, um, you've done a lot of work in the United States. One of the courses that I'm thinking of is the Hideaway, but um, are there other courses in the States or, uh, that you're particularly proud of? Is that the one you're most proud of or... I, um, I mean, the hideaway turned out really well, which is a high-end private club. I did one course, Pete Dye did the other golf course. A uh, lot of younger members for the desert, because the desert tends to attract people who have retired to a degree. Right. But more younger people are coming out, very popular. Um, there's hardly a house for sale now, and there are, I think, there are over 500 lots there. Um, uh, tradition just down the road is the same beautiful golf course, Lionel Palmer design. Um, I think they have maybe one house for sale there. Wow. I think it really changed. People are coming out from LA and the coast, and I think COVID had something to do with this, but uh, both those great courses. Um, Madison next door, the other side, is a wonderful course, uh, Tom Fazio. So in the desert, we've got 125 courses to choose from, which is, is amazing. Uh, of my work, uh, I did uh, Belgrade Lakes in Maine. Right. Which uh, was- Award-winning design there, right? Uh, that was uh, voted uh, number one course in Maine by Golf Magazine and Golf Digest. Um, I did uh, Lake Winnipesaukee, and if you can spell that, I will give you a dozen golf balls. <laughs> uh, Lake Winnipesaukee, um, which I did for Bernard Shu, who was a very nice client. 
and uh, that, that started at number two and then went to number one course in New Hampshire. Uh, I've designed uh, Eagle Falls, which is in the valley here. It's uh, part of a casino, which is probably as desert courses go nearer to a lynx. Um, it and you had to move a lot of earth there, right? From what I recall. Yes. Well, the desert, as you know, it's it's the sites that you know ninety five percent of them are just pan flat. Yeah. As was Hideaway. So you move dirt, and uh, uh, yes, that that was for uh, the casino, which is owned by an Indian group. Uh, that worked out well. Very busy. They do a lot of rounds. In fact. Everywhere in the valley now is pretty, pretty busy. Yeah. Um, so those, uh, you know, are some of the courses I've been involved in in the States and done one or two um, restorations, really, um, um, remodels, I would call them. Right. Restoration is really putting it back to how it was. Right. Years, you know, uh, the remodel is you're starting... Uh, well, like Indian Wells, for instance, um, the resort, there are two courses there, I did one of them, and there was an existing course which we, at the end of the day, decided just to blow it away completely. So you could say it was the restoration, because three holes only are in the same place. Yeah. The rest right. is, goes every which way differently in the layout, and the brand new holes. Um, you know, each... Each site is its interesting own challenge. A different, yeah. very different designing, say a course in the middle of Great Britain to something in the desert, to something on the East Coast, to Dumbani Lynx, which is a genuine lynx, um, which you enjoy the challenge of having to think differently about each site and how it should be treated. Right. Um, what you advise to the client. And I think in fairness, you know, the 30 odd courses I've done, generally the client accepts the designer or the architect's advice on where you're going and layout. Sometimes, right. you know, they want to spend maybe a little less or sometimes even a little more. Right. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's gotta be an interesting process because you know, you know best, or right. I mean, you're the architect. You've got uh, the experience of having played on tours and just a, a vast array of experience. But they're the ones writing the check, and ultimately, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people want things done their way versus what what you feel might be best. One of the questions I've got. I don't want to spend a lot of time on Eagle Falls, but I do have a question for you on that. Sure. Um, there's a hole there that you. Uh, modeled after the uh, postage stamp at Royal Troon. Is there an hmm. affinity that you have for that hole or Royal Troon? That oh, I think that's a wonderful hole. It's so short, yeah, and yet so many people can. It, it's dramatic because even in an Open Championship, I think the record, as I remember it, was Herman Tesis, who was an amateur. Um, he was an amateur golfer from Switzerland who used to play in the sixties, and the record he took the number on the postage stamp as it's known for true was 13 in an open championship but um i don't think herman's around anymore so he won't be too upset <laughs> uh, but um well have you heard about what gene cool. saracen I, did I there? Like the excitement because yeah uh, it's a bit like uh 17 on the old course you know anything can happen yeah and we saw that very windy day a few weeks ago, the 17th at Sawgrass, the TPC. Right. Where into a strong wind and nearly half the pros dumped it in the water. And it's right. 140 yards long. Right. Um, you know, it gives the, it, it, it creates, I guess, um, it's a bit like man gives money to charity or man gets bitten by shark uh, the man getting bitten by a shark gets the headlines more than the nice thing that happened right that's a good point like to see a bit of a train wreck in sport it's you know it's part of the excitement 
Right. Well, yeah, look at John Vandeveld at 18. Exactly. In 1999 at, at Carnoustie. Yeah. That was, that's very difficult to watch. And he, he got very, well, I guess he got lucky with his tee shot and an unlucky on a second shot. Yeah. But yeah. In have fact, you heard what? A few weeks ago, I saw John, um, he was that tied away with me. We had a glass or so for about an hour. And, um, we had a we had a very good glass or two of red wine. It was right up his street. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't dwell too much on uh, Carnoustie happenings. Uh, but no, the difference actually on that hole you're referring to, which which is I like to say um, inspired by the postage stamp. Right. It's not faithfully copied. Uh, the difference on my hole is it's about 18 to 20 yards wide in the green area width. The postage stamp is nine to 10 yards wide, which is, and that's how they play ping pong across the. Right. Did you hear, have you, have you heard the story about what Gene Sarazen did there when he was invited? You know, he, he had won the open championship and I know today they don't, I think if you're over 60 or whatever, you, you, you're not welcome to come back, but. In the early 70s, he was invited back and he was playing. And he didn't make the cut, obviously, but he played uh, the postage stamp on Thursday and Friday in a total of three strokes. And he was wow, 72 years old. old. Wow. Which That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, I have a train going by now. I don't know if you can hear that in the background. My office is a... Uh, oh. Look at your background. I thought it was the old ghost of train from Dumbarney because um, if the there viewers can see, um, just about over your right shoulder, there used to be the main line from Edinburgh uh, down to St. Andrews. Oh, really? Yes, it went right through. And in fact, <clears throat> uh, I think it was British Rail or Northern Rail had the option starting a new project in the early 1930s and they were choosing between this site and Glen Eagles and they chose the Glen Eagles site. Wow. Thank goodness they didn't choose this site because I, I wouldn't have had a nice Lynx uh, site to design a golf course on. <laughs> well you know it's funny today um, Clive I, I, I posted um, a photograph of Rory McElroy playing at Royal Troon in an open and he's kneeling down and there's a train whistling by over his shoulder on the 11th um, at Troon. And I, I, I know that, that back in the 1850s through the 1950s, mm -hmm. the train travel is really what helped expand golf. Because if you think about mm -hmm. it, people from London or Edinburgh could go on holiday to Aberdeen or or uh, the coast of, of England to 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 uh, enjoy their holiday and, and play golf and that um, the railway lines would build hotels along the way near golf courses. I know Cruden Bay had had one as an example mm -hmm. by them, but um, trains were very important. And even at the old course, that railway shed on 17 was mm -hmm. where the train Train the train went. used to pretty much go through the old course hotel in the old days, and it went right. right along the 16th hole. I mean, you could drive out of bounds onto the railway line. Right. And uh, I remember Longhurst was commentating as um, uh, Tommy Aaron. Tommy Aaron was playing the hole in the Open Championship. And so the camera cut to Tommy Aaron who had been second in an extraordinary number of uh, tournaments in the States. Uh, so Longhurst said, well, here is the impoverished Mr. Aaron, who seldom seems to win a tournament, but has had a lot of seconds. And just then the train came past on the 16th hole as he was playing it, and the camera's still on him, and the camera followed the train. And he said, well, there you, there you see the train coming from Edinburgh. I see its number 
four six four five five four three five. Uh, which is a great deal better than Mr. Aaron has done over the last six <laughs> holes. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is, uh, you know, we don't, you don't hear that sense of humor on TV anymore on, in golf commentary, right? I mean, you get the yeah. occasional, I, I don't find Gary McCord is f that funny, but David Faraday, I find funny, but oh, Faraday's the boy now. Yes, yeah. I mean, he's yeah, very no, funny, Fred but is a very funny guy. I, you know, way back when we were both in Britain, um, I had a dinner or two with Faraday, and no, very sharp, very quick, very good show that he does. I mean, yeah, rich. well, and I think it overshadows what a great golfer he was back then. I mean, he was mm. a very good golfer. Oh yes, and actually, he was an opera singer too. Believe it or not, I didn't know that. But yeah. I would say he had a career similar to yours. I'm assuming you had a lot less alcohol involved in your career than he did, but. I tried hard, but I wasn't in the same class. <laughs> no. But no, he, he won a handful of tournaments over there as well. He played mm -hmm. on one Ryder Cup team. He played well in an open champ, a couple of open championships, mm -hmm. but I would say similar. Um, okay, so we're we're winding it down. I've got a couple more questions left. So oh, you've sure. you've designed somewhere over thirty courses. Is there one that that stands out as giving you the most satisfaction when you completed it? And I know that's like asking which of your children is your favorite, but is there one that was particularly satisfying? Well, I, I think the one shown behind you, Dumbani Links. Um, uh, a, it was very satisfying. B, I'd always wanted to do a genuine Lynx golf course. And this is a, I would call it a genuine Lynx golf course with a modern twist. There are a few things that are different from the great older golf courses. Um, B, it's won an extraordinary amount of uh, awards over the last six months. It's been voted um, best uh, development of the year. The 2021 best golf course of the year, which uh, they're, they're, they're worldwide uh, yeah. awards, and uh, recently uh, Scotland's Scotland's best golf experience, which we received about three or four weeks ago. Congratulations! Uh, which you know is pretty nice because uh, the, these awards, you know, they, they they don't come every day, unfortunately. Right. Right. Um, so that's been a great thrill. Um, Hideaway is one of my favorite courses. Um, and it, it's helpful if you have a lot of time to spend during construction. You see, that makes a difference. Hideaway is just a mile down the road from where I live. So you can give a lot of visits. Right. There or not. Uh, Scotland, I lived over there while that one was being constructed. So, you know was there a great deal of time, six days a week, yeah. working with the machines. So you're getting, your, your vision is getting interpreted as you see it. Now, you know, if, if you're doing a golf course that's 5,000 miles away and you're making visits, you know, you might get there once every three or four weeks, which is very common with uh, architects, well, particularly right. if they've got a lot of work on there. They can't be there all the time. So that, that's a big advantage. If other than one of your own courses, what would what's your favorite course to play? Um, I haven't played it since I was an amateur after the war. Oh, yeah, after, no, yes, after the Walker Cup, we went to Pine Valley for a few days to play golf for the Walker Cup team. I really enjoyed Pine Valley uh, and Cyprus. I like a lot. And one of the reasons I like it, the holes are very individual and many of them remind me of courses in other parts of the world. You see a bit of uh, um, Royal Melbourne, for instance. Uh, I see a bit of Sunningdale there. I see a little bit of Birkdale where there are a couple of sort of linksy holes in the middle with right. sand dunes and white sand. So uh, yeah, I, I would pick those two. I mean, there are many others. There are so many great golf courses around the place. But, uh, What's your favorite Lynx course to play? 
again, um, other than Dunbar. <laughs> when I when I was playing golf, uh, playing in Open Championships, I would probably go for Muirfield, and the reason is a uh, competitive pro, I would say Muirfield is because you've got the fairest bounces. In other words, short of the green was reasonably flat. Many of the old Lynx golf courses, there's humps and bumps and on a genuine Lynx, and particularly then there was no water on the fairways, you could be hitting an eight iron and you had to pitch it 10 yards short. Yeah. So you're also relying on the bounce, which... Yeah. You know, is could go any which way, even with a great shot. You might miss the green. Right. You might hit the green with a less good shot. <laughs> right. Well, it remind. I, I agree with you. Now that you say that, it it is fair from that perspective. I've played there several times, uh, but it reminds me. I was playing at Royal Sinkports about ten years ago, and I'm sure you've played there many right? times. And uh, we were on the back nine. And I don't remember the, the whole number, so excuse me for that. But a friend of mine who was a long driver piped one right down the middle. We never found the ball. And I'm telling you, Clyde, it was a straight ball hit right down the middle. To this day, he hates sink ports. Right? He goes, that's just unfair. I hit it perfectly right down the middle. And we, we probably spent 10 minutes looking everywhere for that ball. And well, there were some bad seagulls about in that area, you know. <laughs> that, it, it hasn't been totally unknown for one to lift the ball and take off. Yeah. Okay, so my last question. In your golf life, golf-related life, what, what, what are you most proud of, of all your accomplishments? Uh, perhaps, well, two things. The last round in the Open... Uh, when I finished third, playing with Jack Nicholas, and that horrendous 6-5-5 start, yeah. sunny, breezy day, and getting around in 72 after that, as, as virtually four over par after three holes, yeah. um, was a very good effort. And I think um, I played very well in amateur golf, but with Walker Cup, uh, I was undefeated for the four rounds I played. But the, the, the last round, or in fact, the, the previous singles, I played the same uh, a young man called Hayes. It, the next day, I beat him five and three the, the first day. Then suddenly he played very, very well the second day. I was two down and three to play. And I was the only match alive on the golf course. And if I lost that match, we lost the Walker Cup, and I finished 3-3-3, three, 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 holding a 33-footer on the last green to get a half. I mean, so we halved the whole thing, uh, and that, as I say, was the last match. So uh, that, that was quite memorable. Yeah, that's amazing. Nothing like representing your country, is it? It's uh, a lot of pressure, but a lot of fun if you happen to play well. Right, right. Well, not having played at that level but having uh, followed um, and appreciated both the Walker Cup uh, and the Ryder Cup and the Solheim Cup, they're all exciting. Um, you never know what's going to happen. Um, anything could happen. And I think, you know, most recently when the U.S. won the Ryder Cup, uh, we were rather jubilant. Uh, but they, and they think, hey, we've got this sewn up for the next several years. We've got a great crop of players. Mm. They forgot that we got waxed in Paris just two years before, right? It wasn't um, anything could happen in the Ryder cup. And I'm looking forward to the next one. As a matter of fact, uh, you'll appreciate this um, next year. Well, this year we're taking a group over to, to Italy to play. Uh, it's a couple's trip. So we're yeah. going to start up in Tuscany and we're going to end up down at um uh, Marco Simone, where they're going to play the Ryder Cup next year. So our our guests will be able to play on the Ryder Cup course, which um, I don't know anyone in America that's played Marco Simone Golf Club. I'm and then next year, it's relatively new, isn't it? It is. It is. But we're going to go over. We're going to take another group over next year to play 
similar courses up north and then go down and watch the Ryder Cup uh, at nice. Marco Simone. So anyway, Clive, it's been a real pleasure uh, having you on the uh, podcast. And uh, I, we can't thank you enough for your time. It, it's, you've got a fascinating life. You've got a wonderful design business. And, um, you know, I played Dunbarney. It is literally one of my favorite golf courses ever. And, and as I said, we're going to be sending a lot of people to play there. So thank you very much. Oh, great pleasure. Thank you for all your very excellent questions and uh, allowed me to talk probably for far too long. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> very enjoyable being with you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks again to Clive Clark for sharing his amazing history and wonderful stories. Uh, we're excited to be able to get to play Dumbarney Lynx this summer in July. Um, if you guys enjoyed this video, please share it with your friends and family. Uh, I hope to see y'all again next week. Thank you so much.